and really excited to share with you our work today on heavy duty um, electric vehicles, which I see as really the next frontier for electrification. Um, so just on this title slide, uh, this is the Port of Oakland, just up the way. Our office is about a mile or so from the Port of Oakland. Uh, and ports represent uh, one, one uh, area that electrification uh, is particularly well suited for. Um, so just a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Just a little background on the Union of Concerned Scientists, um, the need for electric trucks, the state of electric truck uh, and bus technology, um, where we can electrify, um, and how do we get there? Um, so first, uh, Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, founded in 1969 um, on the campus of MIT uh, by a group of grad students and professors. Uh, and so this was Vietnam era. Our first uh, concern, so to speak, was uh, the uh, nuclear weapons research um, industry, so to speak. Um, funding from the government going to nuclear weapons research. Uh, and we. Our founders thought that um, there were better ways to spend uh, federal funding and to put science to good work. Uh, one of our founders, um, Professor Henry Kendall from MIT, won Nobel Prize uh, in 1990 um, for discovering, with a team of other folks, uh, the internal structure of the atom, um, what, what makes up protons and neutrons, the quark, um, if you've heard of the quark. So we've had a, a deep scientific uh, underpinning from, from the get-go. Um, and what we do today, we've continued our um, research and our work on nuclear weapons. Uh, so here's a fact sheet on um, the United States. The president has a unique authority for kind of a, a single button authority to launch nuclear weapons. Uh, this is something that we continue to work on. Um, we work a lot on climate change. This is a, a report that came out last year documenting uh, sea level rise and what we're seeing already today um, with interesting, or not interesting, but um, sad or profound implications for even uh, the Bay Area. Um, we do a lot, especially in today's um, political climate, I'll, I'll be nice, um, on protecting the integrity of science. Um, so uh, giving federal scientists the um, authority to, to do their science and not be constrained by, by politics. Uh, this is a report my colleagues put out on the Trump administration's um, sidelining of science advisory committees. Uh, we also do a lot of work on food and the environment um, and a lot on vehicles. And this is where I fit in at UCS. Uh, so clean vehicles is a big part of our work. And we've been doing this work in California for about 25 years. Uh, so our tagline is science for a healthy planet and safer world. Um, and my shorter tagline I tell people is we work on science-informed policy. Uh, so we do technical analysis ourselves, and we use that technical analysis and analyses of others to inform policy positions, um, particularly at the state and federal level. Um, a little bit local, but particularly state and federal. All right, so... The need for electric trucks uh, and buses. Um, so trucks in California, um, may, I'll be a little interactive. Any guess on what fraction of the vehicle population trucks make up out of all vehicles? So uh, raise your hand if you think it's more than 15. 15%? More, less than 15%. Okay, the rest of you. It's about 7%. Um, what about the contribution to climate change uh, from, from the transportation sector? So the transportation sector overall is about 37% of California's GHGs. Uh, so if trucks are 7% of the vehicles, what fraction of, um, of the vehicle GHGs? Um, more than 20%? It's 20%. <laughs> Trick question. <laughs> Um, so a disproportionate impact, and the same can be said about uh, NOx. So NOx are, is nitrogen oxides or oxides of nitrogen. Um, these are the smog-forming precursors. Um, so NOx reacts with, you know, photochemical reaction with sunlight uh, and other stuff in the air to form smog. Um, California has really bad smog and NOx and 
o ozone is also synonymous with smog, uh, really bad uh, smog problems. Uh, and so this is statewide. So trucks, 7% of the vehicles uh, contribute a third of all statewide NOx pollution, not just from transportation, all sectors. Um, statewide diesel particulate matter, so particulate matter is the, you know, the fine particles that uh, come out of the exhaust of a vehicle. Um, PM 2.5, you've probably heard of, PM 10, that's the size of the particles. These are particles that um, are bad to breathe. Diesel particulate matter is particularly bad um, because it has other stuff adsorbed onto the surface, um, bad stuff that is the result of the incomplete combustion of the fuels. So trucks uh, and buses, heavy duty vehicles, contribute uh, a large fraction of diesel particulate matter in the state. Um, and maybe just to put some of this in context uh, a little more, just in the context of the United States, uh, this is uh, uh, global warming emissions from three different sectors. Uh, the pink is the electricity sector, uh, green is the transportation sector, and just for sense of scale, industrial sector. These are the three big ones. Um, and you may have heard in the news within the last year that the transportation sector nationally passed the electric power sector as the largest contributor to global warming emissions uh, in the United States. Um, so transportation is something we really need to, to pay attention to. Um, this trend has been true in California for since the 1990s. Uh, transportation has been the largest source of GHG emissions in California for many years. Um, this is California's GHG emissions um, by fuel type um, going back to 2000. And so, you know, you see we've decreased a little bit. Um, we're making some progress. Um, but I just want to put this in context of where we need to get. Uh, and so we have uh, a state law that says we need to reduce, um, we need to get back to 1990 levels by 2020. Um, so we're kind of close to that. We have another state law that was passed, I guess, a year ago that we need to get to 40% below 1990 levels by 2030. That's a much steeper target. And we have an executive order from Governor Schwarzenegger um, where we need to get to 80% below 1990 levels by uh, 2050. So these are, these are big goals, uh, and it's going to take a lot of work to get there. Um, just to pull out a little bit of the information from that previous slide, uh, looking at where our GHG emissions are coming by fuel type. We often look at it by sector, but if we look at it by fuel type, I, I find it a little illuminating. Um, my guess, green is gasoline. My guess is that gasoline would have been the highest by far just because transportation is so high. Um, if you combine you know, gasoline and diesel, it is the highest. Uh, a surprise to me in looking at this, just as an aside, is how big of contribution natural gas contributes to the statewide uh, global warming emissions. Um, so definitely a sector that other colleagues at UCS are, are trying to, to tackle. Uh, and, and then coal, uh, we don't have much coal in California, or we don't import electricity that is generated from coal. Um, by 2025, we'll have no imports of electricity from coal. So we're doing, we're doing good on that. Um, really just to drive home the state of affairs on the pollution side, this is the American Lung Association. Um, just last week, every year in April, they come out with a list of the most polluted cities. They also have a list of clean cities, so it's not you know, just a negative report. Um, this is the most recent um, state of the air, as they call the report. And you can see that California is not doing good. Um, top seven of the, or eight of the top 10 uh, in, by ozone. Um, also bad in year-round particulate matter and short-term particulate, particulate matter. Uh, and so, and you know, call attention to that the Bay Area, we're not uh, immune to uh, poor air. We think of LA and the Central Valley, and they certainly are the worst. Um, they're, they're so bad, they're out of compliance with air standards from many decades ago. Um, the way that air standards work is you, once the standard takes effect, you have decades to comply, uh, and 
LA and the Central Valley are coming up on those decades of compliance periods where if they don't get their air quality below certain levels, uh, the federal government would do something, supposedly. I don't know what that would look like in this administration, but um, it's, it's, a bad, it's a bad state of affairs down there. Um, and you know, we've certainly come a long way in terms of air quality compared to where we were in you know, 60s, 70s in, in LA. Um, but there's a lot of science showing that the levels today are still unhealthy. Um, I also want to emphasize the point that um, on the air quality side, not all people are impacted the same. Um, so this is a map of a, a portion of LA. This is uh, the San Pedro Bay where the ports of LA are, just for reference. Uh, this is downtown LA. Uh, and these, these maps show uh, low income population, um, the minority population, and uh, concentrations of diesel particulate matter. Uh, and just graphically, you can see that there's a high level of, of overlap. Um, it may not surprise you, but there, there are disproportionate effects uh, for low-income people and people of color on air quality, uh, most likely to live near busy roads, near warehouses where trucks are coming in and out, near the port, uh, near the refineries, et cetera. Uh, and so this motivates a lot of our work. Uh, and maybe just to put a, a cap on that, uh, we work with a lot of groups across the state um, smaller groups, community-based groups, uh, to help them, you know, give them our scientific um, expertise on issues they're working on. Um, we put together a video, I won't show it, um, just documenting some of the experiences that folks across California uh, experience day to day, um, you know, living next to, very close to proximity to freeways, et cetera. Uh, next, so state of technology, where are we at? Um, and so I'll start, my talk's about trucks and buses, um, but I, I want to emphasize um, where we're at today with trucks and buses is in large part where we're at with light duty vehicles. Um, we've come incredible far, um, far away in just a few years that I think exceed the expectations of many people. Uh, we still have a long ways to go. Um, so a couple numbers just on the light duty side. Uh, California is by far the leader of electric vehicle sales in the United States. Uh, we have about half of all electric vehicles in California. Um, this region of California, the San Jose, South Bay, um, Mountain View, Palo Alto area, is actually a leader amongst California. About 9% of vehicle sales in this region are electric vehicles, so you all are doing quite well down here. Um, and so I, I show these light duty cars. Uh, this was just on my walk. I live in Berkeley. Um, this is just my short little walk to BART last week. Um, and just in my neighborhood, personally, I'm seeing a lot more vehicles, electric vehicles, just parked in, this, in the neighborhood, um, parked at the BART station, um, and from all makes and models. So you know, it's not just Tesla. Um, I see a ton of these Chevy Bolts. Um, this is the Toyota's uh, fuel cell car, the Mirai. Um, which, you know, fuel cells are, used to be um, what people thought would be the future, and battery technology um, kind of leapfrogged that in a lot of ways. Um, but Toyota is still investing in fuel cells. Um, so it's just interesting that we're seeing these too. Um, they're they're hitting, hitting the roads. Uh, so a lot of what is happening in the light duty space, uh, battery costs coming down dramatically, uh, is driving what we're seeing in the heavy duty space. Uh, and so what, so what is that? So uh, one of the beachheads, so to speak, of electric uh, vehicle technology in the heavy duty sector are transit buses. Um, and so I know you all on campus here have a nice little fleet of electric transit buses. I think 20, I think campus has 20 electric buses, uh, which is absolutely great. That's one of the bigger fleets across the state. You see you all should be extremely proud of that. Uh, having 20 buses is a big deal. Um, this is a bus uh, down in Southern California, Foothill Transit. Um, they're one of the leaders in the state. They, they plan on transitioning their entire fleet to all electric by 2030. Uh, so they're in that process. They have about 30 buses right now. Um, any guesses on the range of this vehicle? Let's say um, 150 miles uh, below. Okay. A lot of people think 150 miles or more. 
Uh, you're right. Um, this bus is about 250. Um, you can configure it to have even more if you put more batteries on it, up to 450. Um, and so these are sticker miles, of course, you know, depending on how you drive it and whatnot might be more or less, which I mean, talk to transit you know, operators, they get really you know, picky about you know, what, what, how much range they're going to get. Um, but that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, 200 plus mile range is kind of just my rule of thumb what I, when I talk to people for transit buses. That's going to cover almost every route that's out there. Um, the average route is 150 miles or less uh, in California transit routes. Um, so there's, you know, of course, a few outliers that you know have unique routes, um, but it's pretty impressive. And, and that's come along just in a few years. Um, I should say this bus is made by a company called Proterra, um, which is just headquartered up the street in Burlingame. So another source of pride for uh, this part of the bay. Um, here is just maybe the the boring way to say what I just said um, with a picture uh, that we're seeing across several different manufacturers um, buses with high ranges. So this is that Proterra bus, um, 300 plus mile range. Um, and so the good news for me when I think when I see this slide is that there's several manufacturers. Uh, Proterra has a couple different models. Uh, Van Hool has a fuel cell bus, um, and so this the blue is the range and the green is the charge time. So fuel cells have the advantage that you can just stick a nozzle on the bus and fuel it up, um, you know, 10 minutes or so. So kind of comparable to a diesel or conventional fuel. Um, BYD is another big company. They're actually the biggest electric vehicle maker in the world. They're the biggest company you've never heard of. Um, they're based in China. Um, and most of their sales are in China, but they have now uh, set up manufacturing uh, outside of Los Angeles and are selling a lot of buses and heavy duty trucks in the United States. Um, Complete Coachworks, um, they're another California company down in LA area, San Diego area, uh, and New Flyer. This is actually old data. They have a much higher range. Uh, so it's great when you're working in a field where your, your data gets, at, your slides get outdated, when the, the field is progressing faster than you can update your slides. Uh, and that's where we are with electric uh, trucks and buses, for sure. Um, and the other good side of the equation for range, and so why do I talk about range first? Range is like the first question everybody asks. You know, like, how far is it going to go? Um, if you're a fleet operator or if you're, you know, buying your own, personal car, like range is a very critical piece to these vehicles. Um, this is data from the US Census. Um, they stopped collecting this data, budget cuts. Um, they stopped collecting some of this truck data. So this is a few years old. But the latest data we have for how trucks operate um, shows that surprisingly, a lot of trucks are operating with ranges of 50 miles or less. So they might you know, make a couple 50 mile trips within a day, um, but their, their range of um, operation is 50 miles or less. And 50% of trucks in California fall in this category. Um, so there's a, a huge opportunity to electrify. Um, long haul trucking, you know, I think is what comes to people's mind when you talk about electric trucks or whatnot. Um, and that's kind of a romantic version of, you know, when you, when you hear trucks. Um, Somebody on the, you know out in the I-80 between Nevada and you know Wyoming or something, and um, there's a lot of opportunities just in cities, and cities is where the pollution problems are. Um, so a thing, a thing that a point that I think um, misses is missed on a lot of folks, um, and maybe just to illustrate um, some of the range and technology capabilities. Um, this is uh, a bus made that by that company BYD that I got a ride uh, a couple months ago. So this is down in Santa Monica, palm trees. Um, they picked us up down there, um, and we drove to their factory 75 miles away outside of Los Angeles to do a tour. Um, so the bus driver started at their factory, drove 75 miles, picked up um, like 50 of us that were on the tour, drove back, so 150 miles. Um, we, we did the tour, really cool to see you know, where buses come from, so to speak. Um, their, their capacity is about 750 buses a year. Um, and they just had a press release last week of their 
doubling the size or something. They're, they're out in the deserts. So they're building a big uh, second phase of the factory next door. Um, here's the route we took. So you know we were driving through LA traffic, a lot of stop and go. Um, not you know necessarily the best place when you're trying to optimize range, so to speak. Um, this is a fairly decent grade up up Highway 14 up here. If anyone's ever driven it, um, and so I show all this just to really emphasize what this bus did. Um, 150 miles. We took the tour. It charged for maybe three miles, three miles, three hours. And then it turned back and did the same thing. It drove us back to Santa Monica, and the bus driver took the empty bus back to the base. Um, so 300 miles in one day with you know, fully charged when it started, charged for three hours in the middle. And that actually replicates the duty cycle of many um, transit operations. So you have a, you know, a, a peak uh, operations in the morning. Then the bus will go back to the depot um, for th a couple hours, and then go back out for the afternoon peak and then have another shift in the evening um, and charge for a few hours overnight, so three to six hours or something. Um, so the technology is really, really suited for a lot of applications. Uh, another question is, I, I mentioned, how, how do they do on hills? Um, and so this is just a, a video, uh, hopefully it'll work, just of that bus ride. And we're going up a hill and we pass a diesel truck. That's, that's the punchline. Um, <laughs> and we passed it, we passed it hard. Um, and we were fully loaded, so um, these buses can do well on hills. That com the company Proterra, just up the street, um, they've taken, you know, they've heard this myth before from people that they're trying to sell buses to. Oh, how do you do on the hills? Um, so they took their bus to Utah and went up every, to every ski resort in the Wasatch mountain range. Um, up to Park City, up to Solitude and Brighton, up to uh, Alta and Snowbird. Um, these are serious grades, you know, 10, 12, I think one peaks out at like 17% grade. Um, and, you know, no problem. Um, the interesting thing when they, when you go downhill, you can recharge the battery. Um, I was surprised at the amount that it did recharge. Um, something like 10% of the battery was recharged as going down like a 10 mile grade or something. Um, so just an interesting um, thing about batteries that you don't get with other technologies. Um, so this is the other big question we get. Uh, how do the life cycle emissions of electric technologies compare to combustion technologies? Um, and this is actually where the kind of the heart of my scientific contributions to this area is, is doing a life cycle analysis of different technologies. Uh, and so this is uh, work that I, I did. Um, so diesel, diesel is of course, uh, this, and this is for transit buses. Um, so a lot of our data is just, transit buses are representative of other heavy duty vehicles. Uh, and there's a lot of data for transit, via, transit buses because they're publicly operated and they have to report data and whatnot. So we know their fuel efficiency and those sorts of things. Uh, so diesel, um, by far the worst, uh, and so this is um, CO2 equivalent emissions, uh, and so this is life cycle. So what comes out of the tailpipe and also the emissions from producing the diesel or whatever the upstream fuel sources are. Uh, natural gas is a little better, depends on natural gas leaks, um, and also depends on the period of time that you consider those leaks to occur. If you're looking at a 20-year global warming potential period versus a 100-year global warming potential period, the results are quite different. Um, if you use the shorter time frame, um, natural gas is actually worse than diesel. Um, so that's a, a policy question, um, as much as it is a scientific one, which, which uh, time frame to use. Uh, fuel cells, um, about 50% of the CO2 emissions uh, from diesel, compared to diesel. Um, you may notice in, in my notes, um, California has a law that requires 33% of hydrogen produced in the state to come from renewable sources uh, today. Um, so this is great, because the other source of hydrogen is natural gas. Um, even if you got all of your hydrogen from natural gas, the efficiency of the fuel cell, um, you would still have lower emissions than using it in a CNG vehicle. Um, but ultimately, if we want to decarbonize, we want to get away from natural gas, uh, et cetera, 
uh, getting hydrogen from water is, or other renewable sources is the best um, from a, a life cycle emissions perspective. Um, and battery electric uh, vehicles, buses on today's grid, by far the lowest. Um, this is California's grid mix in 2016. Uh, and the good news is the grid is getting cleaner. Um, the trend, this trend stays true across the United States. Um, this is a map showing equivalent miles per gallon for light duty cars uh, across the country depending on the electricity grid mix. Um, so in California, charging on the grid here, 109, 110 MPG equivalent. I mean, if you were to go out to a car lot and someone said, I'm going to sell you a car with 110 miles a gallon, I mean, you, that's, that's incredible. That's like um, something that doesn't exist with combustion technologies. Um, but that's the equivalent life cycle emissions that we're getting with electric vehicles on today's grid. Um, even in the worst grids in the country, um, uh, the mid Midwest is you know, coal heavy, um, a 38 MPG equivalent. Um, so you're still in the, in the range of like a Prius. Um, if you, if you, this is using the average efficiency of electric vehicles on the road. If you, so electric vehicles, some are more efficient than others. Um, if you have the most efficient electric vehicle, um, all these numbers look better. Um, so we're doing pretty good across the country. Um, and you notice the, the, high, the highest numbers are upstate New York, where they have a lot of hydro, um, which just kind of silly numbers, so to speak, just how, how much better they are from a climate perspective. Um, and so this, is, uh, this, this map is the work of a colleague, um, and probably one of the images I show most fre frequently. I keep it in my favorites on my phone, because I feel like I'm always uh, showing this to people, because it's a really real, it's a reasonable question, a realistic question. It's a question we should be asking. Um, and, uh, and the results show that we're doing pretty good. Uh, and just to emphasize, you know, why we're doing so good, um, this is a map showing the renewable portfolio standards for states across the country. Uh, so California, we have a 50% renewable electricity goal, or law, it's actually a law, by 2030. Um, and other states, um, we're one of the highest. Hawaii, Hawaii is 100% by 2045. Um, but by and large, these RPSs across the country are what is driving a lot of um, the decarbonation of, decarbonization of the electricity grid. Um, and just to show that graphically, you know, we're seeing renewables increase over time, uh, coal going down. So we're, we're on a good path. We have a lot more to do, but, um, but we're, we're in a good place. Um, the other question, back to the, kind of back to the, how do the vehicles do up a hill question, uh, is how do they accelerate? Can they handle the load, um, particularly with, with uh, heavy duty trucks? Um, this is a video from Toyota comparing uh, the acceleration of a, their fuel cell truck uh, to a diesel truck. And the results are, they speak for themselves, I guess. So very good acceleration, high torque, just a property of electric motors. Um, how many people have ridden in an electric vehicle? Uh, keep your hand up if you've driven one. All right. So you know, they're like super fun to drive, right? Um, and I've actually gotten to driven one of these heavy duty trucks. They, they drive like a car. Um, it's kind of scary, um, but pretty neat too. Um, so, so the performance of these, these vehicles is, is good. Um, just a few more numbers on the performance. Um, you know, ha ha noise is a big thing. Um, electric vehicles have a lot lower noise. Uh, this is a decibel scale, so you know, these are factors of 10 um, better. Um, this is acceleration time, so electric, similar acceleration time. Uh, to these diesel, natural gas. 
Again, these are bus numbers from buses, bus testing. Um, fuel efficiency, uh, this is uh, the big one to me. Um, so four times as much uh, efficient as, as efficient compared to combustion technologies. Um, and then this is the ability to climb hills, of something called grade ability. Um, so pretty good across the board. Um, and one thing I think is just worth pointing out, you know, these are electric vehicles are much simpler um, machines than combustion. You know, you have to really admire the work and the engineering that's gone into making combustion vehicles as efficient as they are today. Um, electric vehicles, electric motors have a lot fewer moving parts. Um, and that, you know, it shows how a company that, you know, makes vacuum cleaners um, thinks that they can maybe get into the electric vehicle world. Um, it's just a different technology. Um, and so that, that, that's an exciting thing just from, you know, Silicon Valley innovation. Um, I think it's an exciting thing with this technology. Um, on the heavy duty side, this is a, a truck made by a company called Thor Trucks. Uh, they're based down in LA. Um, they started like two years ago and they have a truck that I think this is a 200 mile range semi truck. Um, and it's a bunch of kids that just graduated college, and they're, they're young kids. They, they're not making any of the components themselves, they're just sourcing all the components and putting a tr building the truck. Um, but it shows, I mean, they have this truck, it's, this isn't just a, a picture, it's, you know, they're testing it on the road, you can't buy it, but they're testing it. Um, and so, you know, they're a startup, are they gonna be the next thing? I don't know, but it's just an indication of what the technology, uh, where it is, and how fast things will change. Um, and along the same lines, uh, this is the unveiling of the Tesla Semi. Um, you know, our, our friend Elon Musk there. Um, I got to go to that in, in LA. It was unlike any other truck event I've been to. Uh, probably more, it was more like a rock concert than, than a truck event. Um, you know, just surrounded by Tesla fanatics, uh, which, you know, I like Tesla's cool. Um, but it, it, people were going nuts when Elon Musk stepped out of this truck, like, like he was, you know, a rock star. Um, so, you know, there's such a thing as the Tesla effect. I mean, we've seen how they've pushed automakers in the light duty space to enter the game, Mercedes and BMW, um, their competitors, and they're doing the same thing in the heavy duty space. Um, other truck companies I've spoken with have said the interest in electric vehicles from their customers has skyrocketed since Tesla's, you know, so it's, it's good for you know the whole um, the whole field um, California I, I've indicated we're a hub for manufacturing in the electric uh, truck and bus technology this map uh, is outdated already uh, there's 14 companies listed um, there's probably five more that aren't on here um, here's Proterra uh, BYD is a big one um, so exciting to see the state develop these. Um, and then the other big question is cost. What's, how do these vehicles compare on a life cycle cost basis? Um, this is kind of a, a busy slide. Uh, this is from the Air Resources Board. Uh, they've done some really good life cycle analysis on transit buses. Um, I'll just call out, here's just two um, bars. Here's a, a diesel hybrid, total life cycle ownership, so this blue is the cost of buying the vehicle, and then there's uh, infrastructure costs, fuel costs, et cetera. Uh, and this is compared to a battery electric bus on uh, PG&E's grid, so that's you know, the grid around here. Um, and over the life of the bus, the Air Resources Board has found cost savings. Um, so my tagline is, it's competitive, if not cheaper. You know, there's I don't know if to the point where it's you know absolutely cheaper. There's charging, you know how you charge, what time of day you charge, um, affects the total cost of ownership. Um, but we're doing pretty good um, for transit buses. You know they're still having a high upfront cost to purchase. Uh, even if you're going to save money over the long term, just how transit buses make their purchases, that might not be compatible. Um, because there still, there can still be barriers with that high purchase cost. Um, but the cost equation 
is why you're seeing big companies. Um, UPS has a press release from last week or something saying, we're getting into electric vehicles not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it's cheaper. Uh, we see a you know, cost savings for our, our business uh, to do this. Um, and again, just to emphasize where some of those savings come from, um, electricity prices are, are generally much cheaper. Um, for a light duty car, my rule of thumb uh, varies across the country, but about a dollar per gallon ga of gasoline equivalent, depending on where you live. Um, so that's pretty good. Um, residential rates and commercial rates, there's differences that you have to think about. Um, so that dollar might not necessarily hold for the commercial sector, but um, for light duty, um, it's pretty interesting how, how cheap it is. Uh, so where are we going to electrify? Um, um, I guess maybe how I think about this, um, you know, this is um, Roger Bannister, broke the first man, first person to break um, four minutes in the mile. Um, and after he did, you know, kind of opened the floodgates. People were uh, breaking four minute miles um, shortly thereafter. And I guess I kind of see that's, you know, how technology can happen. Um, you know, the innovation curve that once, once you see a company doing it, improving it, um, other companies can, can follow. Um, and ultimately we need to get to the point where a lot of people are doing it. Um, you know, beta breakers is something that, if you look back here, you know, anybody can sign up and do beta breakers. Um, so that's where we need to get with the technology where it's just, it's ubiquitous. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm optimistic we're, we'll get there. I don't want to oversell my optimism that it's not going to happen overnight. Um, and it's not going to happen without a lot of work. Um, you know, continued innovation, uh, investments from, you know, state, federal sources. Um, that I'm optimistic we'll get there. Um, it is happening in other places around the world. Um, this is a picture from Shenzhen, China, um, a big city, 12 million people or so. Um, this is their bus fleet, um, well, part of their bus fleet. They have 16,000 buses that serve this city. Um, the state of California, we have 10,000 buses. So this one city, I mean, it's a big city, but not as big as the state of California. They have more buses than we do. Um, oh, and they're all electric, 16,000 buses. Um, this is where the company BYD, this is where they're headquartered. Um, so it can be done. Um, China's moving at an admirably fast pace um, and arguably the, the leader in electric vehicle technology, um, light and heavy duty. Um, so it, it can be done. Um, here's a snapshot of other sectors um, and some mileage uh, of some vehicles that have been deployed. So just a, your general truck, you know, you can pull a container full of, you know, Pepsi or Coca-Cola in there. You can um, have a bus, uh, another truck from, this, this truck is from a company that is a Cummins or, you know, very famous diesel truck company. They're getting into electric. This is Toyota's fuel cell. Um, this is a linen delivery truck company. Um, this vehicle is made by another Bay Area company, Motive Power Systems. Um, Tesla, of course, they, they advertise a 500 mile range. Um, people were, when Tesla, you know, everybody knew Tesla was gonna come out with their truck. People were expecting it maybe at 250, 300 mile range. That would be that was going to be, you know, even on the high end for what was on the market before then. They announced a 500 mile range, and and people, some people are people are, it blew people's minds. Um, let's say that I guess. Um, we'll see if that's realized, but um, that's a pretty pretty far range that people weren't expecting. Um, school buses. Perfect opportunity, um, interesting opportunities for school buses to uh, act as energy storage during the day. Um, you know, when the grid is doing its thing, when there's a lot of solar, you can maybe charge the bus during the day when um, the school bus is parked. Garbage trucks, um, and then, you know, just delivery trucks. This is a, a company called Change. They're based down in LA. Um, they have like a 5,000 truck deal with 
Ryder truck, you know, the rental truck company, Ryder, they're going to sell Ryder, like 5,000 of these electric vans. Um, so it's, it's just one of these things, it's moving very fast. You know, every day there's something different in the news, another company making an announcement. Um, it's very fast paced uh, and exciting to see. Um, I think I'm going to skip ahead because I'm just chatting a lot. Um, LA has made a commitment for their electric buses. Um, VTA, Valley uh, Transit Authority, just down the street. Um, Sam Trans in, in the neighborhood and AC Transit, also in the Bay Area, doing good things on electric buses. Uh, airport in San Jose, doing good things. They're going to get 10 electric buses coming on soon. Uh, here's just a map of transit buses. Here's Stanford. Nice job, you all. Uh, airport shuttle buses, you know, these, they go back and forth between, you know, two miles all day long. Um, they're not traveling more than 50 miles a day. Um, perfect place to electrify. Uh, I mentioned the ports. This is a picture of the Port of Oakland. Um, they do, this is a, a tour I did. They do tours uh, once a month. Um, the first Monday of the month you can sign up. It's a free tour. They take you out on a boat. It's one of the coolest things you can do in the Bay Area, I think. Um, especially if it's a nice night like this was. Um, but ports are a great opportunity for electrification. Um, all these containers, you know, they got to be moved by something. They're often moved by trucks. Um, whether it's these um, semi-trucks, so-called drayage trucks, that take a container from the port to a warehouse nearby, and then the contents are repackaged for a long haul truck or other, other purpose, um, more drays trucks, or if it's uh, trucks that operate exclusively on the port property, um, these terminal trucks, so to speak, another great application for electrification. Uh, UPS, you know, these delivery trucks, UPS trucks drive about 100 miles a day. Um, so also a great application. Um, so how do we get there? Um, California is definitely a leader in electric vehicle technology um, writ large, but truck and bus for sure. Um, you know, incentives help, and, you know, carrots, so to speak. Um, this is a, you can't read this, of course. Um, this is a list of all the investments that the state has made with money from the cap and trade program. Um, so, you know, there's different opinions on the cap and trade program, how effective it is in actually reducing emissions because the price on carbon right now is like $10 or so. so it's not a super high price on carbon. But one thing that that price on carbon has done is generate a lot of revenue for the state um, that we didn't have otherwise. Um, and so in the case of uh, vehicles, the, the state has invested, this is a billion, um, 1.2 billion. Uh, from cap and trade money into electric vehicles or clean vehicle, cleaner uh, vehicles, not all necessarily all electric. Um, but this is a unique thing that California has that other states don't. We're investing disproportionately uh, in electric technologies. Um, so something to be very proud of. Um, infrastructure is a big one. So you know, getting the trenching for the charging stations is kind of the nuts and bolts of what you know, changing over from one type of fuel to another looks like. Um, it's a lot of construction, a lot of, um, you know, we need a lot of electricians. If you want to solve climate change, uh, become an electrician. Um, there's a proceeding going on, the State Public Utilities Commission, um, that would allow utilities across the state to make investments in electric vehicle infrastructure. Um, they proposed a billion dollars worth of this infrastructure over a five-year period. This is a big investment. Um, I'll leave it at that. Um, I wrote a blog about it. Um, the other way to get vehicles on the road is kind of the, you know, the old, old-fashioned way uh, with standards. Um, you can require fleets to do this, require fleets to purchase electric vehicles. Um, this bill that passed last year became law uh, in California requires, by 2025, 15% of state purchases of trucks to be zero emission, uh, battery or fuel cell. Um, so that's one way. You can require fleets to purchase them. Uh, the other way 
is to require manufacturers to make electric vehicles. Uh, this is actually the strategy that California has taken for light duty vehicles. And this is why there's so many more electric light duty vehicles in California than there is the rest of the country. We have a law requiring manufacturers to sell electric vehicles in the state. Um, other states have joined on to that. Um, it's called the ZEV program. They represent 28% of vehicle sales in the, in the US. This is all light duty. Um, that California is thinking about doing this for the heavy duty sector as well. Um, this is, yeah, just about done. Um, UCS, we do a lot of cool stuff. I have great colleagues. Um, check us out. There's a lot of ways to get engaged. If you want to, you know, write letters to your congressperson or your state assembly person, um, we do all the hard work to track those issues and help people engage. Um, we have a network where we use expertise of people with professional training uh, on issues that we work on. We rely on outside experts um, in a lot of the work that we do. Um, we're, the Science Rising thing is um, a new thing we're doing at UCS, um, trying to make science a part of the 2018 midterm elections. Um, Check that out if you're interested in the election side of things. Um, so yeah, conclusions. Uh, we, need, we need electric trucks and buses, um, air quality and climate. The technology's here um, and it's clean. Uh, and we need policies to get there. It's not gonna happen by itself. Um, we have a long ways to go. Uh, so really happy to be here and thanks for your time.